out to see it. <laughs> hey, okay, our journey begins in Buenos Aires, which is up there. And uh, from there, we'll fly to and explore Patagonia, and then fly back to Buenos Aires. Now, just as the Great Plains runs from the U.S. up into Canada, so Patagonia is an area that covers all of Lower Chile and Southern Argentina. That whole thing, it's not a part of a country, it's a region. And the Lame River is kind of the northern boundary out of there. Well, we land in Buenos Aires, home of the tango, with a lovely basilica around the corner from our hotel. It's a city of eclectic architecture, and if you ever get lost in the city, look for that obelisk. It's a structure with absolutely no meaning that I could find or anybody could tell me. It's just there. And it's exactly the height, a half the height, of the Washington Monument. So it is a good landmark, visible in the city from where you are. Nine Julio is a nine-lane boulevard, nine lanes, with islands out in it. You have to kind of dash to for safety between the traffic, and then you dash across to the other side. It, I think all five million people in Buenos Aires use that street every day to get around. <laughs> and on 9 Julio, there's that beautiful building in the middle there, the Opera House, the Teatro Colón, one of the most important opera houses in the world. And it's only a few blocks down from the obelisk. OAT stands for Oversea Adventure Travel. That's a group we traveled with. They handle small groups of people 50 years or older, and uh, maybe 15 people in a group. And we travel with them a number of times, enjoying every trip. Andy, our OAT guide, is the fellow in the yellow glove kneeling in the middle front and center. Now, Argentina has a tortured political history. It's not all tango. This man standing there is Manuel. He spoke to us at the Wall of the Disappeared. It looks a lot like the Vietnam Wall. Pointing to his mother's name. That's her picture. She was a university student when she was abducted right off the street and tortured killed, and her body disposed of. They often would just dump them in the ocean. They found her body later, exhumed it, and forensics at the CIA lab determined it was his mother. And um, she had been shot seven times before she was disposed of. Manuel was an infant at the, at the time. She, his mother, was one of some 22,000 people that disappeared in Argentina. There's also, besides the wall, what, what did I just hit? The wrong button. No, no, no. Let's go. There, there, there. Okay. There's, besides the wall, I better keep this off that deck, a memorial to the 16 grandmothers who disappeared. That's the little scarf on the head protesting the abduction of their grandchildren. The grandmothers would demonstrate, and occasionally one of them would disappear too. Um, the other pile of rocks over here is a display they have for those who died during the COVID epidemic because they blame their government. Their government had made a a deal to buy Pfizer, but then they reneged and instead bought the cheap Chinese COVID vaccine, which did not work. It was part of a corrupt dealing in their government back then. So they still have problems. But this is a city of monuments. There are 16 of those little scarf monuments around there. Following his discussion, we went to a crazily painted section of the city full of mannequins, tango dancers, and tourists. Following Manuel's presentation, it was 
can I say, emotionally dissonant, but it still was uh, worth visiting if you ever get down there. That's me standing next to uh, Pope John Paul II. He's a rock star down there, I think. They revere that man. And you can't sit down at an outdoor dining table without tango dancers demonstrating their art. Now, the tango dancers, the women, will come up to any man and ask if I would like their picture, my art picture taken together. And if you say yes, why they will, for a price, and they will charge you for that. So don't do I said no. <laughs> it was safer that way. This is the inside of that Teatro Cologne, that opera house, completed in 1908, with perfect acoustics, they say. Strauss, Stravinsky, Aaron Copland, and the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra, as well as many others that played there. This is the place. Then it was time for our tango lesson. Are you ready? <laughs> yeah, watch her feet. And you guys, make sure you stay clear of them. Because <laughs> they move, especially if she gets dancing good. Now, Buenos Aires is the tango capital of the world. They have many tango clubs. But you better be good. You don't want to be a learner and go out there and slam around like they do in American dance halls and call it dancing. They're, you're good. Or they won't let you The dance. accordion player in the background was She's very, very famous, too. Yeah. All right, so this, this was our lesson. Now, we're going to let you watch. It's about two minutes. <laughs> okay, the next day we flew out of Buenos Aires, that was where we came in, uh, and we flew to a town called Bariloche, that's a city up in northern Patagonia, it's an international ski destination also called Little Switzerland, up in the, on the east side of the Andes Mountains, but it's beautiful, people go there from Europe to ski when the ski season in Europe is over because this is south of the equator, so it's winter down here. Beautiful. Oh, golly, it's a stunning place. Uh, it's a, it reminds you a lot of the Sierras at that times because there's, this is a giant sequoia, which is there. It has an alpine feel like northern California, but up in the mountains. Well, Many settle, uh, Europeans settled in this area, and they built things like ski lifts. This is a ski lift that doesn't go to a ski hill, but to a cafe at the top of its hill. 
And up there you get a view, you can warm up. This was our group up there. Did I tell you it's beautiful? <laughs> Did I mention that? But it's, what you can't see is the wind. It's windy up there too. You can, but where I'm standing is a cafe, Glaston. So in bad weather, which is often there, you can sit inside and have a mate or a hot cocoa or a cocoa with something else inside. And they're all very good. Coming down, I thought on the chair, the blues were just stunning. And there's a lot of colors other than the blues. This is all right there in the area. After that, we hiked through what they call a cold jungle. As the climate has changed and the continents have shifted over time, there's still jungle uh, flora, but it's adapted to colder climates. And there's thick growth bamboo and other jungle plants along a river they rechannel to produce hydroelectricity. And I, I mentioned these Central Europeans, many Germans, they brought in immigrants from Croatia, Germany, places like that to settle the area because there weren't enough Spaniards. And they had done a job on the Indians, so there weren't enough Indians either. But this is a, a typical local place called Gilberts. It was formed by a hippie family, hippie couple of uh, German derivation. And they don't sell their beer, Gilberts, in any other place. It's only there. So if you want one, you have to go down there to Bariloche. And here we're just enjoying it. In Bariloche downtown, we have supper in a German-style restaurant called Fondue. And guess what they specialize in? Hmm. There, there are a lot, like this over and over, it'll be a recurring theme. The Europeans settlers down there from Germany and places like that, Belgium. Wake up in the morning. This was the view out of our hotel window. What a knockout of a view over Lake Nawel Wapi. I think that's the name. Downstairs, after breakfast, we have a talk scheduled by a local woman, Nora. That's her, the blonde lady standing there. She's of German heritage, who taught in the local German school. She was astounded when it was discovered that her school superintendent was an escaped high-ranking Nazi. He was deported, stood trial, and went to prison for the rest of his life. That's him on the cover of that book on the right. She stated that her research has uncovered some 300 Nazis fled to Argentina following World War II. And because there's so much German settlers, they had false papers. They just kind of settled right into the neighborhood and found jobs like him as a school superintendent. I wonder how, that's, how he slept at night. Uh, later that day, our group boarded two rafts for a ride down the nearby LeMay River. The river's filled from glaciers melting and was generally smooth enough with the steady current. The entire water comes from melted glaciers up in the mountains. Although sometimes it got a little more interesting going down the river. <laughs> the boulders sticking up like gates from Tolkien's trilogy or something like that. But our driver there was pretty good. The banks were often lined by these incredible volcanic uh, formations, because this whole area is a live volcanic region. Look at those rocks. I haven't seen rocks form like that since we were at uh, Devil's Causeway up in between Scotland and Ireland. It reminded me of that. We pulled our boats out and then stopped for a little rest at this uh, place, and then the next stop we went to was a ranch, an Argentine ranch. Now, you think of American ranches when I use the word, it's not the same. The Argentine ranches are huge and can be well over 100,000 acres, 120,000 acres. They were basically land grants given to get immigrants in there. And the beef cattle, if you want a good burger or steak, it's an Argentine meat because they're all grass-fed on the pockets. They, they don't give them anything else. 
It's just a wonderful meal. But this was a family. And uh, that is mate. I have a little mate cup over there by, at, uh, on the table with a straw. The straw is a steel straw with a filter at one end. And that goes in the cup first at the bottom. Mate is an herb that fills up the cup, and then they pour hot water in. You do not stir it. You'll get mate in your mouth. So you just keep sucking it off the bottom of the cup, and when it runs out, you can pour more hot water in it. So it's kind of like a tea, but uh, not my favorite. So, and don't stir. I did learn that. <laughs> Everyone here barbecues. That is the lifestyle. It's barbecue country. They don't do brats. They do lamb or beef. And uh, that's the main thing. This fellow is Pancho. He's the patriarch. He owns this ranch. His ranch is tiny. It was 70,000 acres. They sold off almost the whole thing to the state. So they only have 7,000 acres now. And they don't ranch. They have tourists come in and do this sort of thing. And that's how they live. Like this. While he's cooking, we go on a trail ride on a cool, damp day. It was wonderful. That's us heading out. But when we return later, it's time for a delicious meal the family has prepared. And Pancho there with that gaucho beret on presides. All the men wear those berets. I wanted one so bad. <laughs> Never did find one. Look at it. Each one of those guys has got the, the, those gaucho berets, and the other guys are not there also wear them. They're all, they wear them all the time, indoor, outdoor, whatever. I think it's shaped to their heads. Um, let's see. This is the family. Look at the sign on the side. It gives their German heritage over there. And as we return, you can see Bariloche across the lake. This is the road coming back from the ranch. Bariloche is sprawled along the lakeshore and the mountains. Now it's a new day, and we leave Bariloche by bus for Chile. We have to go circle around the lake. There aren't a lot of highways around. You have to find the road, circle around the lake, and head off into the mountains towards the Andes, going west. Okay, here we stand with our left feet in Argentina and our right feet in Chile. And there's still wind in Chile. You know when you get to Chile from Argentina, because on the Argentine side, you saw it's kind of bleak. Not a lot of trees. This is the Chilean side. I had to turn around and take a picture out of the bus, just because of the green slopes, the moisture from the Pacific. Chile, um, this is going through the, the passage between the countries right there. But cresting the Andes, Chile is called the long petal of the sea by the Chilean poet Pablo Neruda, if you ever want to read some translated poetry. The poet called it, and its green, well-watered slopes give it away. It's great wine country. There are many national parks. They're very small compared to American national parks. And you have to navigate two border crossings, one in Argentina, next one in Chile. And we get down to, this is on the Pacific coast. That is not the Pacific Ocean. This is a lake actually about 20 miles from the Pacific Ocean. That's Port of Ars, by the way. And this is like all from Port of Ars looking on the corner. Isn't that beautiful mm -hmm. Fuji Lake Mountain? The people here are Mapuche people. They're indigenous people to the area. They were never conquered by the Spanish. Matter of fact, at one time when the Spanish tried to get too rough with them, they killed the Spanish governor. And so the Spanish just kind of left them there. They don't have reservations, they're there. They're kind of in the background, but now they're, they're kind of, I'd say, moving up. But that's one of the most beautiful mountains I've saw. Yeah. And they're big on indigenous art from our Hotel right down on the street, and across the street is that lake shore. And across from Mount Noro, that mountain is right over here, the wind's pointing towards it. 
And booths and large tents display handcrafts made of large and rowley wool and wood. There's a wool hat over there that was made with their wool. They, they are terribly proud of the quality of their wool. <clears throat> From our hotel window, there's a one-man band walking the street down there. He has hat down there to take coins from tourists. He was actually pretty good with all that stuff. And here's down in our lobby. We're being taught how to make one of their favorite drinks other than mate. It's a pisco sour. Pisco is a herb thing that they have down there. And Sour is a little bit of whiskey. It's delicious. It's, a, a, I would say, a very tasty drink. We're all trying it on. I'm in the middle over there, back there. I think it's pretty good. Let's see. I don't even remember where all this is in. But here's Portavaris in the foreground. And Montos Noro across the lake. It's volcanic. Isn't that gorgeous? I just think this is... A stunning place to visit. A picture of a, um, this is a um, national park we went to the next morning, the Vicente Rosales National Park. It's shaped by volcanoes and glaciers. There's another volcano. The Mapuche call this area the meeting ground between man and God. And if you go there, you can kind of feel it's a special, different kind of place. This just looks like a little stream flowing through rock. That's like a waterfall. It's glaciers that have torn through the rock have just sliced through the volcanic rock over the years. This is a bit of what it was like. The water's beautiful blue. It's On the left is a picture of a bridge over this. So you get some scale and a mountain in the background. This is another volcano here. We're driving through the country, and our local guide told us that she and her family uh, live there, and they, they're between three volcanoes, and they're all alive. Periodically, they erupt. They're not explosive volcanoes. They're flow volcanoes. And at first, it terrorized her kids, but then she said, they get used to dealing with it. Like, we get used to dealing oh, there's a tornado down by somewhere. Well, they might have a volcano or erupt nearby. Get used to it. I had to take this picture. If you've ever seen pictures of the United States, some big city about 1920, it probably looked like that if you look up. There's lines, you go through the town, there's lines everywhere, and a rat's nest of lines and cables, and I don't know how they ever track them or fix them. Oat is an interesting outfit. It supports local nonprofit and worthy organizations. They can apply for help. And one of them, and they do that worldwide, not just down here. Um, Kambas is the name of this one. It's a music conservatory helping underprivileged kids develop their talent. It's usually down there, only the rich who get the opportunities for that. There's a very stratified society. They take in kids from homes that are, some of them can't pay a penny. They pay for them so they can develop their skills. And Oak actually built this covered area outside. And inside, after we did the tour of their conservatory, we were entertained by this little eight-year-old girl who can't read a note yet, but she can play by ear. And she is a beautiful pianist. She sat there and just played her heart out for us. And then her mom was so proud. Her mom just came over and just couldn't help but hug her. <laughs> Like you get a kid like that down there. And normally, that little girl probably would never be in the vicinity of a piano. Then later on, we uh, were invited that evening to the, a home hosted dinner across the lake on the other side of the lake. The father is a descendant of German immigrants. We're not talking <laughs> Spanish here. The mother is full Mapuche. She's a local indigenous person. 
We learned how to make empanadas. Anybody know what those are? They're like the local hamburger, taco, whatever. It's, they, they make the bread. We got to make it there. They let us make it, so we had some interesting empanadas. <laughs> um, it's a Chilean meat turnover. They, you can get it in restaurants. You can get it like in taco shops, whatever, and everybody eats them. They had a couple sons. Gaspar was the only one who was home. He's 13. He's, they posed in their house uh, afterwards, after dinner. And uh, he showed us around, and he talked English. I asked him what his favorite subject was in school. He says English. <laughs> and I asked him what his favorite music was. Guess what? American heavy metal. <laughs> yes. So much, you know, for our exporting wonderful culture. <laughs> Next morning, we drove down the coast at 20 miles to this ferry. And this ferry takes us across to an island. And the island is Chiloa Island. It's in the Pacific. Um, and there are plans to build a bridge across from the mainland to the island, but not everybody supports that idea. On shore, we met an old man sitting on the bench Say old, he was my age. <laughs> <laughs> we asked him, or Andy did, asked him what he thought about the proposed bridge. Bad, bad idea. They'll bring in tourists. There'll be fast food. There'll be McDonald's. And worst of all, there'll be pollution because there'll be the salmon farmers will come in. And the, they hate the salmon farmers because. Chile is the se world's second largest producer of salmon. Mm. Much of the salmon you buy mm. is Chilean. It's all farm. All. Mm. And it absolutely destroys the seabed underneath those huge farms. But there's, it's basically a dilapidated town, but still even there there are beautiful things if you just mm. look. They don't care about the color coordination. You get a can of paint, half of Hey, half a side and half a side's another color. Doesn't really matter. Almost any combination will do. The churches here are, are world heritage churches. They're all made of wood, and inside one can almost always find a shrine to the Virgin. In Castro, which is the capital city of Chiloa Island, that church is the main church. Isn't that color interesting? Who would paint their church purple and yellow? But they had a contest, and the children of the town were given the choice. And the children chose yellow and purple. And if the kids want the color, they'll probably go to church. This is inside. Look at the little one. This is by their national, uh, world heritage sites. They're made by shipbuilders back in the late 1800s. They're not architects. They're trying to imitate the lip of stone. They could build you a ship, and as a matter of fact, they could build any boat, they could build houses, they could build cathedrals, but the ships, the churches, all will remind you of ships in a way of wood. This is the city Castro. It's uh, got these, the village is actually built right on the, the ocean. You can walk down this narrow little sidewalk, go in that little, by where that sign is, and come out on the back deck and sit there and the bay and the cruise liner and things like that. This is a couple more pictures of those churches. There are 16 of them, I believe, a dozen to 16. Do they look similar in architecture? All built by the same guys. They built a dozen or so of these churches. But look at the inside of that. That was the inside of the first, of the, that church over there, the blue and white one. That was their theme color. Isn't that gorgeous? We spent the day at um, a farmer's house. He, his name was Raul, and he was a Mapuche man. He was kind of a big shot in town. He is a retired fire chief, and he owns a farm which is self-sufficient. He builds everything. Everything in these pictures are things he built. He built their house. That's a fogon on the left, which is like a sunken fire pit, and they do a lot of barbecuing out there, and by groups, uh, 
and they eat, cook, they're entertained there. This is a local, a local guide woman, a Mapuche woman, underneath a Mapuche flag. It was designed to the sky, the earth, and something else, and with a seven-point star. That's a Mapuche flag, if you ever see it again. And we made this food called uh, Coranto. It's a stew containing shellfish, meat, potatoes, and veggies, all local. His wife, by the way, is um, Mapuche. The Mapuche women are not slaves. They're like um, wise women. We, some people might call them witches. But they're the wise woman. He can build whatever he wants, but he'll ask and get the advice of the wise woman before he does things. Here we are. Everything has a place. Potatoes, all kinds of potatoes. He grows 32 different varieties of potatoes. They're, they're something else. I'm not exactly sure what they I are, think but you they see were kind of like in like a bean or something. Yeah, they're like something like, like, like edamame or something like that. Yeah, like edamame. Yeah, but there's big green prickly leaves that they put in there too, but it all comes out delicious. I don't know how these primitive people can come up with something so delicious. Actually, this is a traditional, wonderful dish. But everything is there. We are working on. Carl's pouring in the wine. You gotta pour something. <laughs> That's a terrible waste of good wine, I think. Yeah. And Chris is working I'm sorry. on it. But it takes an hour. Yes, go ahead. You said the Mapuche people are pretty much left alone. Yeah. So are they considered though part of the citizenship of the country? They are, but Do they have to... they've been discriminated against for ages. Okay. But, I, I mean, I don't know much about the government there, so whether they're voting, I mean, would they, like, participate? And yes, they do. Things? Matter of fact, Raul's son it lives in Buenos Aires, and he's a lawyer who specializes in indigenous people's rights. Mm -hmm. So there, I would, matter of fact, I thought when they talked to us, kind of at the stage where Indians were in the United States back in the 1960s, 70s, Becoming more aware of themselves as a people and their heritage, mm -hmm. and also aware of how they are forced out of positions, out of jobs, out of education, things like that. Mm -hmm. So there's a growing awareness among these people. Mm -hmm. I, I would expect changes in the next 10 yes. years. Mm -hmm. There's a potato field. Garlic drying. He grows all those different varieties of potatoes. I asked why. He says, well, if the buck gets one, doesn't matter. In America, we all one big potato is all russet. Well, what happens if McDonald's closes it down, doesn't want russet? What if there's a potato blight and affects just that one kind of potato? Our potatoes would crash. Multiple varieties, that didn't happen. Unless you're buying organic potatoes here, and then you get a variety. <laughs> there are farmers who are doing that. <laughs> there are. Yeah. There are. He seemed way ahead of the curve on this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was late summer. Apples, peaches, he grows them. They're ripening. He, I was, um, he, was, he lets him over on the left. He's watching as I show him how to Harvest potatoes. <laughs> That's a um, apple press or a fruit juice press that he made by hand on the left over there. And in his spare time, he made mm -hmm. boats and other crafts in his shop. They, they float. I've seen some of them float. Um, a plow that he made. Over here is Pride and Joy. He just finished this as a grist mill making flour. There's one in town already, but he said, this way the neighbors don't have to go use that. They can use this. Mm -hmm. There's a, a sense of togetherness that's there. And he is skilled. Mm -hmm. This is artwork he makes out in his woods on his farm, and they're derived from myths, Mapuche myths. Mm -hmm. um, the woman carved is a spirit of the woods who, when 
men are away from home for a long time. Sailors, a lot of sailors down there on the seacoast, um, they would come home, they may have, um, I don't know, STDs. How do you explain that to your wife? There was a spirit in the woods. <laughs> I had no control of the situation. Well, trade-off, fair play, right? On the other side is this guy. He supposedly is ugly as sin. But when the women, the men's gone a long time, he comes home and she's got a gift for him that he knows wasn't his. How did that happen? I was in the woods. I saw this ugly little man. And they would immediately collapse and go comatose. So they did not know what happened. No, no, no. So the myths help explain a lot in their culture. And Raul had a, a, was a, had a wonderful sense of humor. But he was his skill with his hands. Here he's teaching us how to play Rayula, which is kind of like horseshoes, kind of like bocce ball. And um, he's holding a little tejo, which is like a little ring. And you throw it to a stake and try to get it close, kind of like horseshoes. But it's kind of, he's good. Yeah, he can get 0.75% of the time. Mm -hmm. And these people respect dancers. You should have got that idea from the tango dancing. And mm -hmm. He's a nimble but a dancer, and he was dancing with our group afterwards. We were doing some heavy That's his wife on the left. Yes, that's his wife. The, no, the woman. The, one, the was woman. In our, in our group. No, that's his wife. She was dancing with him. Oh, the one dancing with him. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. That's his wife. She's one of the wise women. <laughs> Coming back to uh, the town from his farm. This, I had to take a picture of, they talk all the time down there about the salmon farms. This is a tiny, tiny piece of the salmon farm. And those are cormorants nesting, built on buoys right by the salmon farm. Mm -hmm. Next day. Oh, yes, I didn't get to that. I gotta... This is the ocean. What we're doing is going to those islands, visit those I three islands out there, our bird sanctuary. It's also a national park. Um, we're going to go out and visit the national park, but there's no docks. How is that going to work? If we all pile in the boat on shore, we're not going to go anywhere. We'll be stuck on shore. So what they do, they have a, a trick. I'll show you now. See those high-wheeled vehicles? On the beach, we all climb into those. Then young men, and waders up to their waist push us out into the ocean. They better like you. They're not doing this for, for fun. And uh, it was not a calm sea. At times I got a little bit worried out there in our little boat <laughs> bouncing around going to these islands. It's wild islands. There's the volcanic activity. There's the sea has been churned up. There's rocks everywhere under the water. Uh, I didn't think so. There's, these are rocks out there in the ocean. On the other side is a seal. They like to hang around those islands too because sometimes little birdies come down and they go for a swim and then they don't go back home. Little birds like cows. They're beautiful, funny looking little guys trotting down in a line to jump in the ocean and take a swim. But Perhaps the water was too cold for some. I mean, you see a turn around and he messes up the lineup going back. I <laughs> said, so, nah, not today. I changed my mind. But it's not just penguins on those islands. There's also flightless geese. Geese with wings that can't fly. They swim they live there. And of course, vultures. The biggest vultures I've ever seen. They're like condors. They have eight foot, nine foot wingspan. Well, say everyone sit there on the roof and looking at it, it makes you feel kind of creepy. Then we got on a plane and flew down to the end of the world. Punta Arenas is a city, the farthest south city on planet Earth. Farther than anything in New Zealand, farther south than anything in Australia. It's down there at the bottom of South America on the Straits of Magellan. 
separating South America from this little island here del Fuego, is Punta Arenas. I thought it'd be a village. I'd never heard of this place. It's an actual city of 150,000 people, a little larger than Green Bay, Wisconsin. Full of monuments. Oh my gosh, this is a city. They got monuments everywhere. And right down by the Straits of Magellan is a replica of Magellan's ship. Going inside, you wonder how these guys ever, ever managed to get around the world. He didn't, of course. He didn't make it all the way around. His ship did. One of his ships. I think 18 men out of the hundreds that started. But you can walk through and explore them. And there's other ships, replicas, the HMS Beagle. Um, Dar the ship that Darwin used to go around in the 1800s found the Galapagos Island, and that's where he came up with this theory of evolution. And monuments to shipbuilders and explorers. And there they are up there looking gallant, and I think the natives look like they're about to get washed overboard. But, and there's our group down in the wind at the southern end of the world. By the way, this harbor is full of life. There's, I mean, it's very active. There's cruise ships to the Antarctic that come in there. There, if you ever want to go there to the Antarctic, there's other ships, freighters. Some ships are so big now they can't go through the Panama Canal. So the ships that used to go through the Panama Canal that have now gotten bigger have to come around South America again. So Puerto Arenas is now having a kind of a rebirth. This is a little restaurant we went into. Somebody in our group found it. I just thought it was cute, <laughs> you know. It is La Luna, and you go into the restroom, and they're full of pornographic paintings all over the walls. <laughs> this is in the, the women's room, not so bad. The men's room was much more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> this is a harbor picture. You can see cruise ships, freighters, trawlers. It's a busy port down at the southern end of South America. As we left Puente Arenas, this is um, to the north of it. That's the view looking south to the Straits of Magellan, the ships out there in the harbor. The village, this village, the city is down here kind of below the bluff. Driving north now. We're headed out of town. Um, yeah, I'll go through there. We've all sorts of different animals. These birds, what are they? You may know what they it are. It says right up here. Oh, I told you. They're <laughs> Nandu. That's what they call them. We call them Rias. And sheep. And they're all running around together. They got some fences out there from some of these ranches. But that doesn't stop them. These birds, all oh, they can go right over them. The Guanacos also, the, they, like llamas, they just use them for a little entertainment, they'll jump over them. Along the way, we met a couple gauchos. These are those famous Argentinian, Chilean cowboys. They live out there. They work on these 100,000 acre ranches on the Pampas in there. They have dressed for cold weather, because this is summer down there, but it's not our summers. And uh, we stopped the bus, got out there, had about six dogs, including a very active border collie. And they talked to us and chatted with us. We got some pics. Then we got to where we wanted to go, the park. And we climb out of the bus, stretch our legs, and hike a while. Let's see that candies back there. We hiked through the dry steppe country, ever closer to the mountains. Suddenly, two male guanacos race by. The one in the back, desperately trying to catch the one in the front to bite his testicles off. So we were told. That way, he doesn't pass his genes on. The winner poses for us on the built right above us. We walk on. Over the hills, the mountains draw near. A glacier in the middle caught the sun, caught my eye. 
I wonder why that mountain in the middle has such a thick band of creamy white stone. And even when we walk away, they and the sky still seem to call for us. The sky down there is just torn to shreds. What's it look like? Well, we, we sit in the cafeteria at our lodge the next morning having breakfast. We look out there and see things like this. I say, I don't know, it looks to me like a camel. Chris says, it looks like a fish. Like Puff the Magic Dragon. <laughs> you know, blue glaciers, ice break off from the glaciers up in the mountains, they drift down on the lakes. That's not good. We hike back to those mountains. Everywhere I turn, these clouds being torn up like this, everything looks like it's just being made. And somebody's not real happy with the way it looks and keeps <laughs> rearranging the furniture. I catch a picture on the left of a rainbow with these mountains back there. This is a, what I was seeing. Such a beautiful blue-green lake resting beneath the rainbow bridge. It looks peaceful enough for even rookie canoeists or kayakers. We turn around, clouds, mountains. In the background, the lake, splash of color. We head back to our, our hike turnaround and there's this twisted forest. There was a burn area that went through there a few years back and it was some rather strange shapes. I kind of like this one. Looked like a face, two eyes up there, mm -hmm. hand over there. The noise it knows, I think, either that or a twisty tongue is pointing off this way. Mm -hmm. Didn't feel inviting. <laughs> Remember that little lake I took a picture of, showed you a minute ago with the rainbow? You don't want to get your canoe down here. <laughs> just to give you a picture, the feel of it was just mammoth, it was powerful. And that's water tearing through the glacier rock, glacial rocks. Now we took a hike in the afternoon along that lake up there. Can you tell there's wind blowing? My hat over there and Chris's hair and these other people. But you can't catch the wind, can you? Maybe you can. It's a constant. This is what it sounded like. Because the wind will be steady at 60, 70 miles an hour coming out of these mountains. And the footing can be tricky. So if you go, pick walking sticks. Driving off, there's wild horses left over from the Spaniards or the ranches. In the bus to kill some time, Andy, our guide and uh, local guide, come up with this local treat. And uh, I'm trying to remember it's what what's on that there's like it's a saltine crackers and some cheese and a some kind of a fudge. Yeah. Not sure what it is. It was okay for a bus trip and it's not something <laughs> it's I want to serve for a yeah. company. And, you know, they love it. Yeah. I think they have that cheese in Scandinavia too. I think I saw oh. it in Norway. Okay. It's real sweet. It's like it's almost caramelized cheese or something. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Could be similar. But These the people all come sweet from tasting. somewhere. The gelatin on top made it sweet, oh, but the cheese itself was. Oh, okay, that's. Different. Yeah. The next place we're going, we're driving up now from south, the southern tip from Punta Arenas, up to a place called El Calafate. You don't ever get tired of this. You don't ever get tired looking out the bus. You're just never bored. At our hotel, which is was a converted ranch house, a hotel's fancy word, a black-faced ibis, which is very rare up 
here, very common down there, just walking by our window. And at the end of a long day, we just kind of sit back and relax and swap stories about what's going on a couple of those guys. This fellow on the far left was a harmonicist. He could play the harmonica like no one anywhere. Blues, jazz, country folk. He just boom, 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 pull that thing out and on a raft so we'd be or wherever on a bus. And the fellow over here is a California legal investor or something like that, big shots. But when you get it on these tours, everybody's just good folks. They just, we had a really nice time. These were good people. Next day, we're going to go to a glacier. Los Glaciares National Park is a home to nearly 50 large glaciers. This one's Petito Moreno Glacier. Towers nearly 200 feet above Lake Argentino. It's a glorious, noisy, breezy place on a summer day. It's noisy because the front of this, which goes around that and on for half a mile, calves constantly. It moves a meter to two meters a day. So there's a lot of noise as these things periodically break off. This picture was taken from the parking lot. You can see on the left down there, you get a lot of stairs. Don't go there if you can't climb up and down stairs, because that's where you'll go. Closer up by boat. It's definitely cooler. The glacial ice is blue from thousands of years of compacted snow. It forms these strange shapes and even open up a window with some beautiful light coming through uh, in that round window in the middle and elsewhere. Think you'd ever like to walk across a glacier at its base? I don't think so. Uh, I can't even imagine trying to cross that broken, tumbled surface. Summer. But two ice caves, if you look behind me, this picture of Chris and me, over here look like eyeballs about halfway out of the water. You don't want to go in there. There's noise happening. That means there's pieces falling down. Notice our apparel <coughs> and that black volcanic rock on the earth. They'd be a geologist. Heaven. Look at this. The earth is in motion. The landscape is always being shaped down there. The Andes are one of the youngest mountain chains on planet Earth. It's still rising. The warp rock proves its power. It's two tectonic plates. The Pacific plate is subsuming. It's going under this Andean plate, which is forcing the west coast of South America ever higher. This is our picture here at the end as we're leaving this glacier. Our local guide is kneeling in the middle. Those two girls are her daughters. They lived down there. They had never seen the glacier before this day. They'd never gone there. You know, people live in New York City and never see the Statue of Liberty. On the way back from the glacier, there's a glaci glaciatorium? I guess you can call it that. It's a museum to the glaciers. It's even, the building's even built kind of like the front end of a glacier, if you look at that. Inside, it's hugely modern, full of um, holograms and diagrams. You could learn anything you ever want to know about glaciers in there. Plus, they have an extra benefit. They have a glacier bar <laughs> downstairs where it's 14 below kept that way. Even the glasses are made of ice. And they have loud rock music, rave music, <laughs> thudding in the background. You can only stay there half an hour and you get two free drinks. Of course, you have to pay for the ticket to get in in the first place. So it's about as free as the ticket can walk. <laughs> Downtown El Calafate, there's a street for the artisans where you can pick up stuff like we did, stuff for your friends or family or grandchildren as we did. And then we fly back to Buenos Aires, preparing to fly home. And we have our farewell dinner down in a restaurant on this canal. 
in Buenos Aires, there's a naval ship there, a tall ship that they used to train their naval cadets on. And it seemed like everybody, this was just a bridge. If you look to the left from our restaurant, mm -hmm. there's a bridge there. It's just packed. It's like everybody in Buenos Aires comes out in the evening because mm -hmm. it's milder. That's the time the buoy starts. Next morning, we visit the city of the dead. This is a place where all the rich and powerful people seem to want to be. There's streets, sidewalks. It's a regular city with mausoleums. Who's the most famous Argentine you might have ever heard of? Ever heard of? Eva Peron? Yeah, yeah. She's there too. There she is. And her famous words? Not don't cry for me, Argentina. Now, that was in that musical. Her famous last words were, I will return and I will be millions. She was loved by the poor people. She died at 33 years old from cancer. We took our final excursion around town down this canal, about 20 miles, 30 miles, 20, 30 kilometers, somewhere around 20 miles away from Buenos Aires. This was built as a playground for the rich and powerful in Buenos Aires. Now it's open to the public. Everybody goes there. Dance hall. Oh my gosh. It's a series of islands in the delta. And the only way to get there is by boat. And they have boats, and you go down. These are neighborhoods. This is just a neighborhood. The streets are the canals. They even have a little park there. You brush the boat your kids down, and you play in the park, get back in the boat, go home. And of course, you have the police patrol the neighborhood. You can travel all over. You can just travel all over Patagonia. You can travel everywhere and see these wonderful things. But the things that stick with you are always the people. Pancho, the family, Manuel and his story, the little girl, they're all, and the, the gauchos. They're, it's the people you meet that stay with you, always. They're, they're, they're the things that make it memorable. If you go and do nothing but see the mountains and things, you've lost it. You'll miss it. One final thing, just was thinking, just after that, we didn't fly back. We went to Montevideo, Uruguay, to visit my sister who lives there. I'm just walking along the beach by the Rambla. I thought this was a little boat sailing by. That's the Atlantic Ocean. The Parasail Ocean. You'll never be without a dream. Thank you. No, Any questions? I love the way you have all the videos in interspersed with your still photos. It adds so much. Well, thanks. I had a video of the two Wanakos chasing. Oh. You, they're fast. I mean, the guys are doing like 40 miles an hour. But uh, I, for some reason, we lost it or I blew it up or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah. But it adds a lot to that. Uh, yes. You said you were there in late summer? Their summer. Their February. summer. February. February. We, February. Spent, we spent the month of February. We tried to get out of Wisconsin in February. In February. <laughs> um, what would you say the average temperature was while you were down well, there? Well, it depends on where you were. Okay. In Buenos Aires? Upper 70s. Even in the mid-80s, it was a... There was or to mid-80s. About like right now. Okay. Uh, the rest of the place maybe 70s. And if you go down to Patagonia, it depends on where you were. Up in the mountains, by a glacier. But you better dress so that you can have layers on. Because it can be 40s, 50s, 60s. Like that down there. Puerto so, Arenas was not my idea of a hot spot. <laughs> <laughs> was the wind that cold? I mean, you were talking about the wind all the time. Was it a cold wind always? Then? Yeah, a lot of it was cold. Boy, when you're by the glaciers and the wind comes down the glaciers, or you're on that boat in front of the glacier and the wind's blowing, you get chilled real fast. I mean, you're looking for hot cocoa. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't really cold in the interiors, though. Right. The wind, it was windy, but it wasn't cold. Okay. Right, right. 
Yeah. And so, the one we were in like the town El Calafate up there at the end, I was walking around like this. You know, it was comfortable. I'd say in low 70s, maybe yeah, 70s. 70s. Yeah, something like that. So this wasn't one of your working trips? This was not working. But you always meet people and then you use them. I mean, you, I'm a writer. And so yeah. you look, you're always looking for characters. You're looking for a conversation you could use or a comment. So you, mm -hmm. I journal. So I come back, I'll have a journal like that of everything that I've been through. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can tap into those when you have a dry spell. So yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's it, always people. Is it the Oaks tours that you have done the work with? Or is that a different tour group where you've gone and, and done, done work at, with local? Oh, people that's here too. Yeah, Oak does that. You'll spend so a day in the a life. Different of, plan, a different tour when right. you actually go and work. Right. Like and in France, we I, I mucked out stables. Yeah. Yeah. We, were, we had a little fun with horses there. In uh, in the Serengeti in the Maasai village, Chris using uh, camel cow dung and mud. Help them fix houses while the men it's, got to dance. You know, they just show us how to do it. it we don't really work. Okay. They just show yeah. us how to do it. Yeah. And there's an emphasis. It's kind of token. Getting to know people. It's yes. token work. And that's True it. culture. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Learn their culture and get to know the people. And really, it's probably more trouble for them to show us how to do this <laughs> than it is for us to I'm help sure them. Bro was watching. Yeah. Watch those potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> But it's a good experience to learn yeah. the culture. It is. It's wonderful to get out with people. Mm -hmm. and meet them. Mm -hmm. cool. yeah, if I had gone down there knowing no Spanish, knowing nothing, I would have missed 90% of everything. You know, that's the truth. Uh, when I was younger, it was fun to throw in a backpack and head off. But now, it's kind of nice to sleep in a hotel bed and to have a guide who can actually tell you, hey, right here at this place, this happened. These people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Other questions, comments? Anybody want to go? Now you know where Patagonia <laughs> is. Mm -hmm. So you will say a pretty good elevation? It goes from the seacoast, Buenos Aires, right down on the Atlantic, up to the, probably the passes through were probably no higher than 5,000 feet. It's a low spot in the Andes to get from Argentina to Chile. But the Andes can go up a lot higher. Yeah. We have 15, 16,000 feet. And they're building. And they're building. They're growing. So that's so very down Well, it depends on where we were. When we were in Morocco, we used the rocket train. We used to be across the desert at 150 miles an hour. Yeah. Yeah. Down here, bus, coach, um, airplane. We flew. Yeah. We flew because everything down there is spread so far apart. And Buenos Aires is way up there. Punta Arenas is way down there. And there's only, there are very few roads. It is, it's too far. There aren't many roads. When you have ranches that are 120,000 acres, there's not a lot of right away. And there's nothing out there, no villages. It's just empty land. I don't, then he said, don't say you're in the middle of nowhere. He told us that. Because you are in the middle of somewhere. <laughs> and that's good attitude, just mm -hmm. good. And over there we have a few little artifacts. The Patagonian wine is delicious. They make a fine Malbec. And uh, the mate cup, you can take a look at that little steel straw. Uh, their wools, they're famous for their woolen and their fleece and things like that. We bought a number of woolen items for our granddaughters because that works in Wisconsin. In the yeah, so, okay. Well, okay. that's it. Thank Thanks you. for showing up.